This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. So last week we talked about Eric Estevillo, as Eric Estevillo, depending upon how you want to pronounce it there, uh, who has sued Twitter for banning Donald Trump. And of course, Eric Estevillo can't interact with Donald Trump anymore. And he also sued uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, and Ilhan Omar, and somehow thought that the court would terminate their accounts, all based on his subjective conclusion that Twitter is unfair, it's basically is, is my summary of it. Well, the court has now responded, and the court has dismissed his complaint. And you'll see the way that this happens is the way that I predicted it. He had filed an informa pauperous motion, which means he couldn't afford to pay the $400 court fee or filing fee for the complaint. So when you do that, the court subjects you to a law, uh, 28 U.S.C. 1915 sec subsection E here. And that allows the court to review the filing on a motion to dismiss standard. Now the pro se complaint still gets reviewed with some kind of lighter scrutiny, but the court does get to review it on a motion to dismiss standard where the court does not get to do that on its own when the filing fee is paid. And that's gonna come into it later, so let's remember that. So this is Eric Estevillo v. Twitter, and this is the court granting the inform pauperis, but screening the complaint is the language the court uses here. And the court writes, pro se plaintiff Eric Estevillo filed a complaint and application to proceed in for pauperis. The court grants the IFP application. Having screened the complaint pursuant to 28 USC 1915E, the court further finds that the complaint currently does not state a claim upon which relief may be granted. And this was one of my predictions that the court might might do this. What the grounds were going to be, maybe standing grounds, I don't know, but my one of my guesses was that it could be doesn't state a claim 12b6. Mr. Estevillo may file an amended complaint that addresses the deficiencies identified in this screening order by February 18th, 2021. Mr. Estevillo purports to sue Twitter. U.S. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and U.S. Representative Ilan Omar. The complaint does not enumerate any particular claims for relief, except to the extent it relies on jurisdiction under the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and other federal statutes. Mr. Estevillo says that he suffers from a myriad of health issues and therefore rarely leaves the house and heavily relies on Twitter for political discourse, debates, arguments, and relies on the fairness of hearing all sides of a political story and needs to hear voices from the full political spectrum on Twitter to make informed decisions. Uh, first, just a personal thought. If you're getting all of your information from Twitter, you're probably living in some kind of a bubble because the Twitter feed is, of course, tailored to you and not necessarily representative of all of the news and perspectives in the world. You really need to be getting your sources and things from multiple places. You know, maybe look at some left-leaning sources, maybe look at some right-leaning sources, maybe look at some sources that try to be unbiased. If you don't know what those are, I know, good luck in 2020 figuring out what those are. In in my opinion, there are definitely some news sites that are left-leaning. There are definitely there are some right-leaning, and maybe ones in the middle are closer to like the Associated Press, Reuters, um, NPR, I know is accused of being left-leaning, but I've really uh, found them to be more factual than trying to, to make a political side just because a news source reports something you don't like doesn't make them left or right leaning. Uh, it depends on, on what they choose to report and why. And you can make some of those decisions for yourself as well. But if you're trying to live an evidence-based life as opposed to a belief-based life or a faith-based life, I don't necessarily mean religious faith. I mean the kind of decision-making that you come to the conclusion first and then look for news sources that support it. The evidence-based life would be where you look for the news sources first and come to your conclusions based on the facts and evidence. If you're trying to live an evidence-based life, then you can look at a spectrum of sources and, and, and try to decide where things fall for you then afterward.
He alleges that Twitter's decision to ban President Donald Trump's Twitter account while allowing Representative Ocasio-Cortez and Omar to consider using Twitter services violates the First Amendment. Mr. Estevillo requests the following relief from the court, that Twitter be required to reinstate President Trump's Twitter account and pay reparations in the form of punitive damages in the amount of $88.7 million for each follower that was without a doubt emotionally and mentally damaged as a result of the president's ban, and that Twitter cancel Representative Ocasio-Cortez's and o Ilhan Omar's Twitter accounts. The court may allow a plaintiff to prosecute an action in federal court without prepayment of fees or security if the plaintiff submits an affidavit showing that he or she is unable to pay such fees or provide such security. The court has a continuing duty to dismiss a case filed without the payment of a filing fee whenever it determines that the action, one, is frivolous or malicious, two, fails to state a claim upon which relief may be granted, or three, seeks monetary relief against a defendant who is immune from such relief. Now, quick note about the fails to state a claim upon which release may be granted. That's a legal terminology and it has a whole thing behind it. So fails to state a claim would be one part upon which relief may be granted is a second part. That's where the court doesn't have the power to grant the remedy requested. So if you fail to state a legal claim, you know, if you're trying to make a negligence claim, but you miss one of the parts, you, maybe you don't, there's no duty, duty, injury, breach, and cause. Maybe you forgot one of those. Or if you're asking for a remedy, uh, the cancellation of someone's Twitter account might not be something that a court has the power to order. To make this determination, courts assess whether there is an arguable, factual, and legal basis, two separate things, for the asserted wrong, however inartfully pleaded. Courts have the authority to dismiss complaints founded on wholly fanciful factual allegations for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. A court can also dismiss a complaint where it is based solely on conclusory statements, naked assertions without any factual basis, or allegations that are not plausible on their face. Although pro se pleadings are liberally construed and held to a less stringent standard than those drafted by lawyers, a complaint or portion thereof should be dismissed for failure to state a claim if it fails to set forth enough facts to state a claim to relief that is plausible on its face. A district court should not dismiss a pro se complaint without leave to amend unless it is absolutely clear that the deficiencies of the complaint could not be cured by amendment. The court finds that Mr. Estevillo has satisfied the economic eligibility requirements of 28 U.S.C. 1915, subsection A, and therefore grants his IFP application. Based on his assertion of jurisdiction under the First Amendment and the Americans with Disabilities Act, the court construes Mr. Estevillo's complaint as asserting claims for violations of same. To the extent Mr. Estevillo's allegations concern defendants operating in their official capacities as federal government representatives or agents, the court construes his complaint as seeking relief under Bivens, Bivens v. Six Unknown Named Agents of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, a 1971 case. The Ninth Circuit has recently observed that the Supreme Court has never explicitly recognized a Bivens remedy for a First Amendment claim. In any event, the court finds that Mr. Estevillo has not stated a claim under Bivens. Alternatively, the court construes the claim against defendant Twitter as one brought under 42 U.S.C. 1983, that's a civil rights law. To state a claim for relief under Section 1983, Mr. Estevillo must plead facts showing that Twitter, acting under color of law, proximately caused a violation of Mr. Estevillo's constitutional or other federal rights. Mr. Estevillo has not pled any plausible facts or legal theory that Twitter qualifies as a state actor within the meaning of 1983. In other words, Twitter is a private entity you know, like any other business that's owned by, by, by people, by other companies, by public ownership through stocks, but not owned by the government, not operated by the government, not, not acting on behalf of the government. So a government contractor can still be a state actor when they're acting in the scope of their government contract. And all of that is subject to a legal analysis as to whether they are performing a government action. 
So when the government does something, yes, you do have remedies under Section 1983 for violations, etc. But when Twitter does something, that's not automatically a government actor, and you have to make those connections. And we're going to see more about this in a moment, so I'm not going to go into it. See Prager University v. Google, rejecting theory of state action that the ubiquity of YouTube's service is analogous to a private entity assuming the traditional functions of government in operating a company town based on Marsh v. Alabama. We covered this. I'll put a bubble. See Divino Group v. Google. Plaintiffs failed to state a claim for First Amendment violation against Google and YouTube based on theory that defendants' hosting of speech on a private platform is the equivalent of a traditional and exclusive government function. Maybe we should cover that. See Lewis v. Google dismissing a 1983 claim for similar failure to plead state action. See Wilson v. Twitter finding that plaintiff failed to state a plausible First Amendment claim against Twitter because... Notwithstanding that it has created a forum for hosting speech, Twitter is a private entity and is not subject to the state action doctrine. Accordingly, the court finds that Mr. Estevillo has failed to state a claim for violation of his First Amendment rights against any defendant under Bivens or Section 1983. On to the Americans with Disabilities Act. To the extent Mr. Estevillo wishes to assert a claim for violations of his rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the complaint as currently drafted fails to state such a claim. Title III of the ADA provides that no individual shall be discriminated against on the basis of disability in the full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, or accommodations of any place of public accommodation. Mr. Estevillo describes numerous health conditions that prevent him from leaving his home, but he otherwise does not refer to any kind of disability. He does not provide any facts that explain how any of the defendants denied him any service or public accommodation based on any purported disability. Now, we covered the Domino's case, where Domino's website was subject to Title III of the ADA because it controls access to a place of public accommodation. But the key distinction there was the place of public accommodation was the store, the physical store. In order to get to the physical store to, to pick up your pizza, you could place an order on the website, and by not accommodating people's disabilities with the ordering process on their website and app that made it fall within the scope of the ADA's public accommodation because there was a physical store. There is no Twitter store. There is no Twitter building that people can go in order to use Twitter. So while I couldn't see an argument, I don't necessarily think the courts will agree that the ADA, as it's currently written, applies to websites that don't have a physical component. To the extent Mr. Estevillo seeks to bring a claim under Title II of the ADA, that section provides that no qualified individual with a disability shall, by reason of such disability, be excluded from participation in or denied the benefits of the services, programs, activities of a public entity or be subjected to discrimination by any such entity. A public entity includes any state or local government, or any department, agency, special purpose district, or any other instrumentality of a state or states or local government. Here, Mr. Estevillo does not provide any facts that would suggest that any of the defendants are agents or instrumentalities of a state or a state or local government. He also does not provide any facts to suggest that defendants excluded him from participation in or denied him the benefits of any service, program, or activity because of his disability. Accordingly, Mr. Estevillo fails to state a claim under the ADA. For the foregoing reasons, the court grants Mr. Estevillo's IFP application. After screening the complaint, the court finds that the complaint fails to state a claim. Mr. Estevillo may file an amended complaint addressing the deficiencies identified in this order by February 18, 2021. If Mr. Estevillo fails to file an amended complaint by that date, or the amended complaint fails to cure all defects, the court will issue an order reassigning the case to a district judge with a recommendation that either the complaint be dismissed in whole or in part, or that the case be dismissed in its entirety. 
The court encourages Mr. Estevillo to seek out the assistance of the Federal Pro Se Program, which offers free legal information for pro se litigants. While the program does not provide legal representation, a licensed attorney may assist Mr. Estevillo in determining whether he has viable claims and may provide guidance regarding how to properly plead them. The court provides the phone number and the website. Mr. Estevillo may also wish to consult a manual the court has adopted to assist pro se litigants in presenting their case. An online version of the manual, as well as free information for pro se litigants, is available on the court's website at cand.uscourts.gov. It is so ordered January 19, 2021, Virginia K. Dumarchi, United States Magistrate Judge for the Northern District of California. And this is not the end of the story, though, because Mr. Estevillo was so confident in his case that he applied for electronic filing privileges and he promptly filed this notice of voluntary dismissal. To the Honorable Court, all parties and counsel, I am the plaintiff in this matter and pursuant to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 41, I voluntarily dismiss this entire case. So that is the end of Mr. Estevillo's case, and apparently also the end of my ability to highlight things because it won't let me do that. And so that is the end of Mr. Estevillo's effort to hold Twitter accountable under the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, or I guess we also saw the Pruneyard Standard, which was the California uh, constitution which has a higher standard for free speech that allows shopping centers to host or rather I guess requires shopping centers to host free speech protests or ac activism in, in in some small way uh, neither of those standards either applies or, or neither of those standards were properly pled I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that neither of them applies but uh, you know, Twitter's not a shopping center. Twitter might not fall under Prune Yard, but that would be a little bit closer. Of course, you might bring that in state court, not federal court. A violation of the California Constitution would probably need to be brought by someone who lives in California, which would make them subject to the California Constitution. I don't know where Mr. Estevillo lives. And it might have to be brought in state court because you don't have federal jurisdiction for things that are within the state's scope of, of jurisdiction. In other words, California's constitution wouldn't be governed by federal law unless there was a conflict between the two. And California can have a higher standard for the First Amendment, or rather free speech, because it's the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, so we're going to call it free speech. So California can have a higher standard for free speech. But it does not end here, because now we have a new matter. We have Maria Rutenberg filing basically the same thing, but she's going through an attorney. She is a, an attorney, and so is her lawyer, Mark Javich. And she writes, Plaintiff Maria Rutenberg brings this complaint against defendant Twitter and Jack Dorsey and makes the following allegations based on personal knowledge, etc. Defendants Twitter and Jack Dorsey wrongfully and arbitrarily blocked the public's ability to speak in a constitutionally protected, designated public forum. This case is not about the free speech of former President Trump. This case is about the free speech rights of plaintiff Maria Rutenberg and millions of people around the country who have a First Amendment right to view, discuss, debate, comment, reply, respond to former President Trump's tweets. Yet Jack Dorsey and Twitter, contrary to their public position of trust, arbitrarily revoked those constitutional rights by picking and choosing which topics people could tweet about, and then ultimately by banning all discussions with Trump's tweets in context. Defendants acted under color of law that was delegated to them when they were entrusted to fairly administer the designated public forum. Defendants' censorship of constitutionally protected speech must be reversed. Therefore, plaintiff seeks an injunction restoring her ability to comment under the First Amendment and 14th Amendments. Maria Rutenberg is an attorney and real estate broker in Redwood City. She tweets under a handle. She is a frequent tweeter. She retweets and likes and comments. She commented on Trump's comments. She retweets and tweets and tweets. And the president tweets at least two tweets on January 6th. He talks about Mike Pence. 
and he says Mike Pence doesn't have any courage. And the tweet was first left up by defendants, and then they attached the claim about election fraud being disputed. And then he tweeted a video of himself with the following transcript, which we're not going to read all of this. And then they kept the video up initially, and then they applied a warning label that says this claim of election fraud is disputed, and this tweet can't be replied to, retweeted, or liked due to the risk of violence. Plaintiff and the public were entirely prevented from commenting on and interacting with the tweet. Then in the evening, defendants removed the video and replaced it with a message that the tweet violated Twitter rules. The same day, Trump also tweeted, there are things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so stripped away and great patriots have been badly and unfairly treated. Go home in peace. Remember this day forever. Uh, based on these tweets, defendants suspended Trump for 12 hours and then they replaced the banners with this tweet is no longer available. Regarding these deleted tweets, the interactive features usually open to the public were also removed. Plaintiff could not view, comment, or otherwise interact with these tweets. At that time, only the three tweets were blocked. However, it was still possible to search and interact with thousands of other Trump tweets. Then, between November 2nd and January 8th, Twitter deleted 62 tweets. And then on January 8th, Twitter removed all of Trump's tweets entirely. I think they suspended his entire account is what's going on there. Removing 65,000 tweets that used to be visible. In doing so, defendants arbitrarily prevented plaintiff and the public from the ability to view and search through the former president's tweets. Plaintiff is no longer able to comment on the former president's tweets. Plaintiff was blocked from viewing, tweeting, quoting President Trump's tweets. And as a direct and proximate result of this misconduct, plaintiff and the public can no longer debate the former president's tweets. So then she makes a 42 USC 1983 claim that the interactive space where the public may comment on the former president's tweets is a designated public forum. That's a, that's a conclusion that is not a fact. Plaintiff had a First Amendment right to view, comment, retweet, quote, and like the former president's tweets. That's also a conclusion. Plaintiff had a 14th Amendment right to due process before her ability to comment was arbitrarily removed in a designated public forum. Uh, that's also a conclusion. And th these are the right ways to make such a claim if there was an underlying basis for such a claim. I'll get to my reaction in a moment, though. Defendants were granted authority by the former president under color of law when they functionally accepted the position. So they're saying they have a constructive state action doctrine here. When they functionally accepted the position to administer the interactive space surrounding former president's tweets. I'm not sure that you can functionally accept the position for some unknown interactive space that you just happen to acquire. No, I think I think they created Twitter and it's a private company. It is held by publicly traded stocks, but when we say publicly traded stocks, that is not publicly traded owned by the government. That is publicly traded owned by individuals. However, defendants were political opponents of the former presidents and could not resist taking biased action. Again, conclusions, not, not stating facts here. We are stating conclusions here. In the weeks and months between the election and the inauguration, defendants began to abuse their authority in administering the designated public forum by interfering with the content of messages, applying warning labels, deleting tweets on certain topics, and preventing plaintiff from commenting and interacting with the former president's tweets. On January 6th, defendants abused their authority under color of law by arbitrarily deleting the space where the public could comment with the former president's tweets when he spoke about certain topics such as election fraud, when it deleted and continues to suppress three of the former president's tweets. And then on January 8th, defendants again abused their authority under color of law when they arbitrarily removed plaintiffs and the public's ability to interact with the former president's tweets that he wrote for the period that he was in office. And they seek injunctive relief requiring defendants to restore the ability for plaintiff and the public to view, comment, reply, quote, and comment, or otherwise interact with the former president's tweets for the tweets that he wrote during the period of his presidency and award reasonable attorney's fees and costs and any other relief the court deems reasonable and just and they request a trial by jury, and that is Maria Rutenberg via Mark L. Javich. Now, to me, that is also the same problem as Eric Estevio's case and all of those other cases, the PragerU case and the Willow case and the other cases that we saw that were cited, is that the defendant Twitter is not a designated public forum. 
it is a private company. And it, under this theory, any place where the president chooses to speak, if the president goes into the lo your local bar and decides to speak, then that makes that a designated public forum. The bar becomes a state actor and the bar is subject to 42 USC 1983 claims. And that is just, that is first simply from a legal perspective, that is not true. But I'm not just going to stop there and say it's not true and force you to, you know, take it or leave it. There, There's law behind this. Twitter would need to be acting as a state actor. There would need to be some sort of connection between Twitter and the federal government. We saw in the Marsh v. Alabama Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court gave a whole bunch of things that need to be done in order for a company town to be subject to First Amendment law or other state action doctrine connections. So in that case, you had Jehovah's Witnesses that wanted to hand out pamphlets on the sidewalks near uh, a, a commercial area. Uh, uh, I'm thinking commercial in like the city skylines means, but yeah, uh, it was a company town. There was an industrial area, but then there was also like a laundromat and, and post office and sidewalks and roads. And the company was providing like garbage services and sewage and water and electricity. And so all of that made it into a real town. And since citizens lived in the town, citizens who both worked at the company and citizens who supported the employees of the company provided laundry services, private companies provided laundry services, and there was a public U.S. post office there, etc. All of that turned it into a, a government action situation. The town was performing the duties traditionally associated with the government, a municipal government, a state government, a federal government. The providing of those services turned the company, the private company into a town that was subject to the U.S. Constitution, the state constitution, and any applicable local laws about municipalities. And so in that case, when a Jehovah's Witness was banned from handing out pamphlets, the plaintiff Marsh sued Alabama and said, I should have a First Amendment right, a freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of the press. I should be able to hand out pamphlets. Now, the First Amendment has some limitations, so that doesn't mean that other people have to receive the speech. They don't have to agree with the speech. They don't have to take the pamphlets, but the person can hand out pamphlets. They can speak their mind on the sidewalk. They can step up on their soapbox and have their own sort of free speech forum to speak. That is not Twitter. Although I can see the parallels, there are also some other parallels. If I'm a newspaper and people send me their opinions and I choose to publish one of President Trump's, former President Trump's opinion pieces or something, does that make the whole newspaper a state actor? No. Twitter chose to host President Trump's, former President Trump's tweets during his presidency. And we do have some law about what happens when President Trump chooses to do that. We have the Knight First Amendment Institute case, a lawsuit filed on July 11th, 2017, where plaintiffs, a group of Twitter users, blocked by President Trump, alleged that this account constitutes a public forum and that his blocking access to it is a violation of their First Amendment rights. The lawsuit names as defendants the press secretary and social media director as well. The lawsuit argues that they and other followers of the account are now deprived of their right to read the speech of the dissenters who have been blocked. And the court ruled that Trump blocking people on Twitter is unconstitutional on First Amendment grounds. The court ruled that the Donald Trump account is a presidential account as opposed to a personal account, and blocking people from it violates their rights to participate in a designated public forum.
The court wrote, This case requires us to consider whether a public official may, consistent with the First Amendment, block a person from his Twitter account in response to the political views that person has expressed, and whether the analysis differs because that public official is the president. The answer to both questions is no. As of this ruling, the seven Twitter users that were part of this lawsuit were unblocked. Later on appeal, the Second Circuit upheld the lower court's opinion. The Second Circuit then denied en banc review, which would have been when the whole court reviews it, the whole, all of the sitting judges from the Second Circuit. And a Supreme Court case is still pending before the Supreme Court. But the key takeaway there is the directionality. So who was it that did the blocking? Did Twitter block Donald Trump's account? No, it was Donald Trump who blocked viewers, who blocked users. And so the key takeaway, the key distinction, the distinction that makes the difference was that Donald Trump tried to block constituents from reading his tweets. The difference in the Estevilo case and in the Rutenberg case are they're trying to do it the other way. They're trying to say that because Twitter blocked Donald Trump's account, that that also triggers the public forum, public actor doctrine. I legally, professionally disagree. I don't think it is illegal for Twitter to have terms of service and to only host speech as long as it does not violate those terms of service. The idea of Twitter infringing upon Donald Trump's freedom of speech rights would only apply if Twitter was, in fact, a public entity in a state actor doctrine situation. I can see the argument, but I don't follow the, the precedent. I don't, I don't follow the common law or the precedent or the connection, the, the legal connection enough to say that Twitter by hosting Donald Trump's account was converting that account into Twitter becoming a state actor. The Knight First Amendment Institute had nothing to do with Twitter being a state actor. It had to do with Donald Trump using his account for government purposes. And whether Twitter blocking Donald Trump's account or suspending Donald Trump's account for violations of Twitter's terms of service is some sort of violation of viewers' rights I, I'm going to come down and say, no, I don't think that that's any violation of any user's rights, and I think it will be dismissed. I think this case will be dismissed on exactly the same grounds, that that the Twitter account was only a designated public forum in one direction, from Donald Trump's control to his constituents. His constituents would not have a right to make some sort of legal claim, especially for injunctive relief to restore the account if Donald Trump starts saying things that violate Twitter's terms of service. But hey, maybe it's some kind of novel legal argument. We do have Rule 11, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 11, requires attorneys and, and pro se parties. It says by making representations to the court, by presenting a court pleading written motion or other paper, signed, filed, submitted, or later advocated, an attorney or unrepresented party certifies that to the best of the person's knowledge, information, and belief formed after reasonable inquiry, here I'll blow it up a little bit, one, is not being presented for any improper purpose such as to harass, delay, needlessly increase costs, two, the claims, defenses, or other legal contentions are warranted by existing law or by a non-frivolous argument for extending, modifying, or reversing existing law or establishing new law, Three, the factual contentions have evidentiary support. And four, the denials of factual contentions are warranted by evidence. And it allows for sanctions if section B here, the representations are some kind of violation of the rule. So the attorney is saying that, that they believe that there is some sort of basis non-frivolous argument for extending, modifying, reversing existing law or establishing new law, I disagree. And if Twitter feels that the representation section of Rule 11 is being violated, it can make a motion for sanctions. Unfortunately, no one else can. And maybe, maybe it's not unfortunate. Maybe, maybe there is really a standing issue for a reason there. But 
I can't see the connection between how blocking President Trump's tweets that violate the Twitter terms of service, how that invokes some sort of uh, state action doctrine, then making things subject to uh, 42 U.S.C. 1983 civil rights claims or for First Amendment claims. But reasonable people can disagree. We'll wait and see how the court rules now on the next stage of this Twitter banning Trump uh, lawsuit series that we've got here. I'll probably have to make a playlist for this. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. As always, keep it civil. I will heavily moderate comments that are out of hand. Um, I would prefer if you make an argument for or against that you give us your basis for it. I often see comments on these things where someone just states a conclusion, and I guess that's fine. I'm not going to moderate those out of existence, but I am going to challenge you to give me your basis for your conclusion. If you just say, Twitter is a public forum, that that's kind of meaningless to anyone who's looking for the evidence or the basis for that conclusion. As I said before, many people live an evidence-based life. I try to live an evidence-based life. Instead of going through my day-to-day, -day, you know, saying, this is true, and everybody who doesn't believe what I believe is wrong, I try to look at what is the evidence and then make a conclusion about what is true based on actual evidence. So if there is a legal argument based on some kind of evidence or, or philosophical basis or something, try to state that along with your conclusion rather than just making a conclusion. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for watching. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education program here on YouTube, also on Floatplain, and on twitch.tv slash lawfulmasses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern. Our channel is community supported by your monthly financial contributions on patreon.com slash ljfrench, sponsors.com slash law, through YouTube membership, and through Floatplain subscriptions. Thank you to the following $50 plus supporters in the month of January. Joe Tyson, Mitchell Roten, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Andy, Benjamin Hightoff, Goliath Cleric, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Rudolph Besherer Jr., Oscar the Prophet, Hot Grills in Your Area, Torpedon, Brandon Abel, Cassandra Curran, Sovereign Titizen, Shadow Tycho, RDH Dragon, Earthbound Star, Nathan McCarty, and Awful Asses with Lemon Fresh. And thank you as well to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on your screen. I hope everyone has a great week. I will see you in the videos that drop. I love you all. Bye.